Alright YouTube, back here again, the Historical Gamer. It's been a, a while since I've done um, a, a, a review or a, a playthrough of uh, Panzer Corps, um, the, basically the modern remake of Panzer General. It's actually been my most successful video in terms of, vol of uh, views and also um, interaction with uh, the YouTube community, so I thank you for that, and I decided I'd go ahead and do another one. Um, partially based off of a uh, request. Um, I did already, I handled the Polish invasion in the first video, although I didn't actually uh, show the gameplay, um, or at least not the whole gameplay. Um, I was successful, I won a decisive victory, so now we've moved on to, to Pol or on to Norway. Um, so, yeah, it's April 9th, 1940, I already skipped through the briefing, I have to capture all my objectives with nine turns remaining for a decisive victory. Marginal victory would be all the objectives except Nas or Namsos. Um, this one's going to be a little bit different because it's going to include some C units, which is going to be somewhat unique. But here we go. Here we are in Norway, and um, just looking over the map for this particular um, campaign, deciding this is kind of what it looks like on the first screen when you go into another scenario is you have little boxes where you can put your soldiers down and um, I gotta say one thing that I really feel is different between Panzer General 2 and, or not Panzer General 2, just the standard Panzer General in this game is the maps feel a lot smaller uh, the original Panzer General, the uh, hexes and resolution and everything, you were much more close in you can get a better top-down view without even going to the the strategic map um, like you can here but everything just feels smaller which it's probably a better thing for kind of a beer and pretzels type thing game but anyway um, let's get going now I know from history that the British are gonna come in in the north um, and their their fleet will come in in the north I believe anyway I haven't played the scenario yet so I wanna have a decently strong force in the north there's two objectives up here we're gonna go to the strategic map there's two objectives in Trotterdam and Nesmos which the British historically put up pretty stiff resistance um, then there's gonna be an objective in uh, Bergen Stanvar and Oslo um, in the in the further south, so um, strong force is going to be needed up, needed up north to hold the British off. They'll probably come in with strong naval forces, um, although we can only put three units in there to start. So I'll probably put a, an infantry and artillery and maybe an armor unit, a little bit of balance with some experience. Um, put a similar size force to take on Bergen because they may be able to move north and assist. Although that terrain looks pretty uh, formidable. Um, and then uh, the remaining forces in the south, uh, probably one unit, one force can take Kredestand and Stavgar, while another force can take Oslo and hopefully use those interior lines. It looks like there's some good rail lines and road lines that move north from Oslo where I could hopefully get north to Trondheim to uh, assist those northern forces. So without further ado, let's get this started. Um... I want good troops up north. These are paratroopers, I believe. Pioneers. So we're going to put a pioneer force here up north. We're going to put an artillery unit up north as well. These are all units from my core that carried over from the previous battle. And then we're going to put an armored unit right here too. So we're going to put an artillery and armor and an infantry. It's going to be a pretty balanced force up north. Um, Kurdish and, and stuff. I missed Bergen. Here's Bergen. Um, for Bergen, I'm hoping. Well, I can use my naval forces here, so we'll just hope. I'm gonna take a risk and hope that one infantry unit. Oh, wait a minute. Let's undeploy them. How do I do that? there you right click on just to give you a heads up when you're deploying unit if you put it down if you right click on it it'll pick it back up um, but yeah we're gonna go ahead and put these guys here oh wow I didn't, I didn't realize those units weren't full strength when you are deploying unit if they take damage in the previous turn um, they don't replenish between 
between uh, battles. That's something I just realized. You can replenish them, but you do have to pay for it out of your prestige, which I'm glad I caught because, yeah, these units were pretty, pretty battle-worn, and I didn't even realize that. But anyway, all's good because I had a major victory, so I was able to pay and get them uh, fresh again. Now, I believe there's some forts in here um, on the way into Oslo, so it could make the going a little bit tough. Um, we're going to go ahead and put my remaining non-mobile infantry over here. Should have replenished them first here real quick. Okay, now we're going to put my remaining troops here to go after the capital. And then we'll kind of group my air units. I wonder how far forward I can put my air units. No, nothing forward. So I'll have to put my air units down here. Might get them closer in. Kind of try and conserve some fuel. All my air units are starting off at 10 at least. So, um, let's see if I can purchase any units. I've got four core slots available. As a heavier tank, I could use the Panzer III. I could use a heavier tank. I'll put it down here. And that used up the majority of my prestige, so we're going to go ahead and advance. Um, when you have a naval unit and you click on it, you can move it around just like any other unit, but then to land the unit, you do just bring it up to the ground. You cannot move and then land in the same turn. So, for example, if I was to sail here, I wouldn't be able to land the same turn. But um, if you are up against the ground when you start a turn, you can land troops in an adjacent square. So we're going to go ahead and do that here. Up north is where I'm going to put a lot of my focus. Um, I know the British have some pretty strong naval forces, historically anyway they did. Um, so I'm going to kind of use my destroyers to feel things out. Um, destroyers are useful uh, naval units in that they can bombard units just like artillery, but they do have to be an adjacent hex, which does make things a little bit risky because, frankly, um, if they're in an adjacent hex, the enemy can fire back. This unit here is a cruiser. You can tell cruisers and destroyers look different. Destroyers are much smaller. Cruisers are much larger. Cruisers can fire at range just like other units of artillery. And the nice thing is, unless you're adjacent to the shore, you won't get shot back at um, by the enemy. So there. There you go. Um, there are submarines as well, which are very useful. Uh, they're harder to hit than ships, so they don't really engage in standard surface actions. But the thing with destroyers is, or with submarines, is they are vulnerable to enemy destroyers. They're very useful against capital ships, which, at least according to the old uh, game, the enemy couldn't shoot back at you if they if they were a capital ship and you were a submarine. Um, I'm not sure if that carried over to this game, but at least in the original uh, Panzer Generals, that was the case. Um, I'm surprised that unit couldn't go that far forward. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and try and head off the destroyers before they get to my subs. Because subs can be much more useful against capital ships. Um, this is actually British. If you put the mouse cursor over it, it'll show the nationality is British. Um, so hopefully I get in there. Uh, we're going to have paratroopers take this airfield and hopefully make my guy's job much easier. Um, so one ship is going to go there. I don't need that many ships over there. That was silly. Oh, there's patrol boats. They didn't have uh, Schnella boats or patrol boats in the original Panzer General. So that's something that's a little bit different with this one. Um, we'll have the Stuka dive bomb here. Oh, that's kind of depressing. They didn't hit anything. Um, let's see. I want to destroy. I don't have a destroyer. What about a Schnella boat? <sighs> Thank you. 
Okay, that's what I was looking for. There are enemy forts in the south. Forts will fire back at ships. Um, maybe not in the turn that you shoot on them, but they will fire back. Actually, I don't know if this is supposed to be the Blusche or not, but there was a German heavy cruiser during the invasion of Norway, historically, that um, was sunk by Norwegian forts near the city of Oslo. The German cruiser was actually carrying um, the uh, puppet or replacement government that the Germans were going to essentially run Norway with and um, yeah I mean they weren't weren't anticipating them to get sunk and it really kind of put the German uh, rule in Norway back a bit um, the Germans ran into a lot stiffer resistance historically than they had uh, anticipated in Norway the the Norwegians really put up uh, a pretty impressive fight, all things considered. The British landed troops in the north and held out for months. Uh, the Norwegians um, fought pretty, pretty well against the Germans, although um, there were a couple of instances of Norwegian treachery, actually. Um, there was a man who in Norway is probably as famous uh, as uh, Benedict Arnold is in America, uh, name was Quiesling was his last name and he uh, before the war he actually met with German intelligence officials and provided information on Norwegian um, positions to the Germans um, he had dreams of basically being the ruler of a post uh, German ruled Norway now there's some debate over um, I guess how much he knew there was a debate over how much he intended Germany to be subservient to Norway and there's the British Navy damn them to hell um, blasting the crap out of my guys um, but yeah I mean there was a bit there was a bit of a debate as to how much he really knew or how much he intended Norway to be subservient or was it more of an ally type thing but uh, he did you know provide the uh, he did provide information on uh, the Norwegian defenses, and then when the war actually began, he quickly set up his own government and tried to launch a coup. Germany did initially support his coup, um, although eventually they turned against it when it was clear that he didn't have the support of the Norwegian people. Um, or not really the Norwegian people, but the Norwegian uh, government, per se. Um, this was a very bad first turn for me. Uh, the British did quite a bit of damage to my ships. I'm not even going to bother trying to shoot, you know, fight them. They're going to demolish my fleet up there, and if I don't get away from them soon, um, they're going to do a good job of demolishing my uh, my military. I need to try and get inland a bit. Mm, crap. Oh, we're ready to go. I wonder my artillery might not survive the next turn. Um, but, yeah, so let's take a look, try and... There you go, you see, submarines are very vulnerable to, um, other surface ships. They don't really get hurt at all by other submarines, though. The, goal, the German Navy really in this conflict took incredibly heavy losses. Um, it, it took months, and you could say it never really recovered. It actually had a fairly strong force going into the Norwegian campaign. I mean, it wasn't anything to write home about when you compare it with the British Navy, but it was still a very effective uh, force, and you know, it, it it posed somewhat of a threat, um, at least in regional affairs to other navies. I mean, it, it was a threat for commerce rating, not so much for anything else, really, but still, I mean, it posed a, a somewhat of a threat. Um, and the Norwegian campaign really devastated it. It lost dozens of destroyers. It lost the heavy cruiser Blücher. Um, I believe it lost a pocket battleship, um, which were German... Um, 
basically there were German battleships, but they were designed between the wars, between World War One and World War Two, and they were heavily limited by some treaty so that had been signed, um, which basically limited them to ha carrying the armament of uh, essentially just upgunned cruisers. That's really all they were allowed to carry. Um, so they were better than pretty much any cruiser, but they weren't strong enough to fight uh, another battleship, essentially. And this really hampered them because when they did try and get involved in commerce raiding, um, the you know the British would just deploy battleships to their convoys and essentially negate the entire value of the German fleet because they weren't able to do anything because the British, at one point in time, a German pocket battleship Genisu and Scharnhorst got loose, and the British simply deployed a battleship to every convoy, and it really, you know, it was effective for the Germans in the sense that it really put a a cramp in the British convoy system, really forced them to slow a lot of things down and delay a lot of things, and you know, maybe cause some shortages in the short term, but in the long term it was incredibly successful in that the, the British you know, uh, a case of the Scharnhorst coming upon a convoy, normally it would have been able to basically wipe out the convoy, but in in the instance the British had a battleship with it, and it was an old 40-year-old battleship. It was designed before World War One, and this was in 1940, and um, instead of decimating a huge convoy, the Germans were ordered to withdraw because standing orders prevented the, the, uh, the pocket battleships from fighting uh, any battleships for fear of them being lost because the Germans simply didn't have enough ships to really compete with the British. Um, so what the uh, Germans had to do was they had to withdraw and instead of decimating a convoy of 20-30 ships, um, you know, a single British battleship basically saved those ships from German destruction, at least at the hands of commerce raiders. Now submarines were still very, very effective for the Germans, but um, it really, like I said, it really hurt them. Um, they had these great weapons, they could do, you know, reasonable things with them, but they still were heavily limited by, uh, you know, the treaty limitations, which uh, they were, you know, supposed to be able to overcome. They were designed, you know, they didn't really follow the limits, but they followed them enough to handicap themselves enough to prevent them from being able to be too successful. I wonder if maybe I under did this a little bit. I might have, maybe I should have deployed more forces to that city. This city's already fallen. And this city will hopefully fall this turn. Even if you don't uh, necessarily destroy uh, enemy units, air attacks can still be useful in softening an enemy up and making them less effective to your attacks. There we go. Um Wow, it didn't destroy him. Hmm. Really trying to get this fort out of the way. Um probably not the most efficient use of my ships. Anti-air weapons were used from time to time against uh, aircraft or against tanks, and were actually quite effective at times. So that's a pretty realistic result, actually. I think I might have overcommitted in the south and not committed enough forces in the north. But oh well. The submarine's very effective in, in the first shot. It's always going to do well when it's on the attack, but when it's on the defensive, not so much. I think I'm going to try and maybe get this ship out of the way, try and save some of my fleet, maybe draw the British away from just decimating me up north. Oh, 
hoping I can at least take Bergen. Jesus. Yeah, let's just say the Navy's definitely outclassed here. Oh my goodness. This is a pretty historical result. The British did actually lose quite a bit of forces, too, in Norway. Um, that is something worth mentioning here, is that the British lost an aircraft carrier, actually. I think they may have lost a battleship as well. Um, the aircraft carrier was sunk by German submarines. Um, and they lost, actually, quite a few destroyers, too, and it really handicapped their convoy escorting abilities. Um, not so much in the battleship field, but without the aircraft carrier and the aircraft that, that came with it, um, they did, did suffer. Uh, quite a bit um, as a result of the campaign uh, in the you know in the short term it didn't decisively crush them um, but it did it did cost them uh, without a doubt it cost them um, quite a few quite a few men um, what the heck was that all right um, so I'm kind of rambling on here as I'm playing. I mean, you see the importance of sea power in a, in a campaign like this. The British are just clobbering me. Um, I'm going to ignore that fort like I should have for a while now. Just focus on suppressing these other units here. There we go. Now we can bring in air units. The nice thing about coastal forts is they don't provide artillery support in the case of an attack. Um, so they don't fire defensively in support of the uh, of the units being attacked. They only they, they fire offensively but not defensively. So it does make them quite a bit weaker or less useful um, for the for the Norwegians anyway. Which I'm okay with. Um, because now I've taken these three cities, I still... Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, there we go. Goodness, I've only got one ship left. Yeah, let's pull back. Really? That's all you did? Well, that's a race against time. Just fast forwarded a tad bit uh, to the next turn. Um, one thing that's different about this game than previous versions uh, is when you actually, you just saw there, British had a ship in a Norwegian harbor and I attacked it with uh, ground units and it actually leads to the units being essentially scuttled. Um, that's something that's a bit different and I really like it too because the idea of, you know, ships holding, essentially holding a city by themselves is pretty unrealistic and outdated and that's something that's that's nice to see in here um, I'm doing well in the south uh, this is actually taking a very historical turn the Germans really overran the Poles in this or in the not the Poles the Norwegians in the south pretty quickly um, where they had trouble was in the north um, and that's definitely the way things are going right now um, the uh, the Norwegians in the south are more or less about to be completely overrun. Is it raining? Great. Bad weather. Okay. Well, um, there are also times, I don't know if I mentioned this in the previous game, but weather can basically ground your, your air units. You can still move them around the map, but you can't actually do anything as far as combat. So it's a good time to take advantage of the weather to uh, resupply and rest and refit your, your air units. Um, the nice thing about a map like this is when you have... Uh, when you have armor like this, I mean, it essentially, or when you have uh, ships like this, they essentially become mobile artillery, which is a very nice thing to have. Just some extra free artillery is always a nice little thing to have. Um, I went ahead and I just took Oslo. I don't really want to get bogged down here. I want to race north, try and overwhelm. overwhelm the British, who are, I believe, the ones who are up north, at least they were historically, but um, I also don't want to leave Oslo vulnerable to counterattack too here, so I'm going to move, but I'm also going to try and fend off some of these local Polish troops and maybe 
get rid of them or so. There we go. And I can leave some of this art, you know, shipping parked down here. I don't think I'm going to really beat the British Navy at this point, so best thing to do might just be to try and minimize them. Or just stay away from them, actually. Probably what I'm going to do here is just try and stay away. But Oslo's fallen. Uh, the objective city of Oslo, Kurdistan, Stavanger, Bergen, and I'm probably pronouncing these terribly, and uh, Trotterdam, at least for the moment anyway, have all fallen. So the only objective cities I need to take, only objective I need to take now is Namos, but it's extremely remote. Um, you'll see this little, I didn't mention it earlier, you see this little line along the side. This is actually the Swedish-Norwegian border, and you cannot cross into Sweden, so it makes your avenue of approach as you see here, very narrow into my last objective, so it's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, I'm actually going to save that for a, a second video. Um, I'm going to end the video here, um, and we'll we'll look at my uh, how I deal with uh, taking Nas Namsos, because um, this has been a pretty quick, you know, five turns. It's a longer video here, but it's been a pretty quick and easy five turns, with the exception of my navy in the north getting obliterated. Um, and those pesky British just harassing some of my units up north, but in the, in the most part it's been pretty simple. Um, I think there's going to be a pretty tough fight to take Nas or Namos or Namsos, and I don't want to make a 50 minute video. So uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. Um, I'll have a second video up uh, shortly uh, that'll be looking at the Norwegian, the final part of the Norwegian campaign, and then maybe. Um, what comes after that. So uh, if you did like this video, um, if it's you know successful, I'll continue to do these. If you did like this video, please hit like, rate, subscribe, and uh, feel free to comment. Um, if you'd like to hear me talk about anything else from a historical aspect on any of my videos, definitely would like to do that. Uh, I do intend to do more of this campaign now uh, since it's had some positive resp responses, and uh, I'll probably talk about some more historical stuff from World War II, maybe a little bit more, a little bit more detail, talk about some stuff. I've got some things I'd like to talk about from the French campaign, assuming I get there and don't get beaten. So yeah, um, like, rate, subscribe, and uh, have a wonderful day.